to everybody in the room. Uh, if I speed up, we just go to our natural pace. So we're trying our best to just keep it all as un-Irish as possible so that everybody has a chance to follow what I'm saying. My name is David McWilliams. I am from Dublin. I am here because two years ago, Jane responded to an email, a rather hopeful email it must be said, inviting Bernie to a festival in Dublin. And we had no angle. You always need an angle. How do we get, I'd answer that phone if I was you, right? How, what's your angle? How do you get someone like Bernie Sanders to come to an inconsequential city on a small rock in the middle of the Atlantic? And then we, thought, we looked at Jane's name and we said, ooh, O'Mara. It's like, oh, well, this, is, this is all good. We've got an angle here, we've got an in. So I called a young fella, a friend of mine, who's a geologist, well, kind of one, you know? And I said, look, O'Mara's. He says, yeah, there's a lot of them. I said, where are they from? He said, well, it's hard to say. I said, do you think we can kind of tickle them by suggesting we found where they emerged from? <laughs> Under what rock we emerged from, us paddies, before we all came here? Because obviously we came here in great numbers. And the unfortunate thing about Ireland is the clever ones came here and they left the stupid ones like us at home. <laughs> And uh, so Jane said, you know what, I wouldn't mind going to Ireland. I said, that's cool, that's cool. So Bernie Sanders, one of the most recognizable names and faces in the world, came to Dublin as Jane's fella. <laughs> And this is what he was known for the three days he was there. Jane's fella, okay? And we did find Jane's ancestry and the mental thing is that she did the DNA test and Jane is 96% Irish, okay? Right? Now that's even more Irish than me, right? Than all of us. So that's why I'm here, okay? We're going to have a discussion about international cooperation for the progressive movement. We have a great panel, and we're going to talk about what we can do together as people from around the world who see similar problems, not identical but similar, and also are looking for solutions, alliances, ideas, people, creativity, all that good stuff from each other. But there's a couple too many economists on the table, me being one, okay? There's a considerably more famous ones right over here, okay? But if I was an American economist, or a British economist, or God forbid, a Canadian economist, I'd come here with charts and graphs and all that sort of stuff to explain what we're going to talk about. But as I'm an Irish economist, I come here only armed with a book of poetry. <laughs> Okay. The book of poetry, and this is the selected works of W.B. Yeats, okay? Because it's interesting, you know? Because sometimes you think when you're faced with all these problems that it's all new. All this stuff is new, it's only happening to us. And then you go back and you look at what Yeats was writing a hundred years ago in Dublin, 101 years ago. Yeats is sitting in Dublin, 1917. He's looking around the world. He's looking at Britain and Germany and Russia and the Ottoman Empire and the Austrian Empire. And he's thinking, what the hell is going on? What the hell is going on? And he decides to write a poem called The Second Coming. Now, Irish kids get this drummed into us so it's not some extraordinary talent for poetry that I have. It's just a fear of Jesuit priests, okay? It's a deep fear, okay? Okay? But I, just listen to the words and then let's talk. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center 
cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed on the world, a blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the procession of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. So think of those words. Things fall apart. Sometimes the center doesn't hold. But why? Because the best people in society lack all conviction, allowing the worst people in society to be full of passionate intensity and win the argument. So this is Yeats talking 100 years ago. I can't think of a better way to sum up what's happening in the world right now than that notion of fragility amplified by the worst people taking the stage and running the show. And this discussion here is, I think, about the best people deciding not to lack conviction, but to come to the table and share ideas together. Because if we don't do that, we will lose. So this is the challenge. We have a fantastic panel. My old mate, old, old mate, Yanis Varoufakis here from Greece. One of the good guys, ladies and gentlemen. Nikki Ashton, Canadian MP for the NDP. Jane's fella. <laughs> All the way from Barcelona, the mayor of Barcelona, Ede Calai. And the man from whom I learned everything as a young economist reading his work, Jeff Sachs, ladies and gentlemen. Yanis, can I start with you very, very quickly? What are the issues that are central and are not only central, but link us all together? The manner in which an inane establishment mismanaged a crisis of its own making uh, and dealt with it after 2008, our generation is 1929, by the way, uh, in a way that combined socialism for the financial sector, unfettered power for the oligarchs, and austerity for the rest of the world and for the planet. That is what binds us together, because now, we, just like the Weimar Republic, was crumbling out under the weight of its hubris, uh, the, the so-called liberal establishment, which is neither liberal nor particularly well established these days, is crumbling under its own weight. Political mo monsters are rising up through the cracks in Brazil, in, uh, in Europe, in the United States of A, um, in Italy, everywhere. And we have a choice. Do we let the bad guys run the show, as you put it? Do we get together as we're getting together today? Or do we do something even more advanced than that, which is absolutely necessary? Because um, Colleagues, friends, comrades, ladies and gentlemen, it's not enough for us to get together and chat once every six months, every 12 months. Because the bad people that uh, David McWilliams was referring to do a lot more than that. They work in real time, in continuous time, every day. And we need to create a progressive international that does work constantly to create a plan, a blueprint, in order to empower the dream. Of course, you know, had he said, I have a plan and not, I have a dream, it would not have worked. Okay. But the dream <laughs> needs a plan. And we need to plan together internationally, not just some white faces, okay. not just you know, males, decrepit ones, um, like myself. <laughs> I feel that I've got jet lag. Um, but we, we need to involve a few Africans, Asians, we need a lot more women, and we need effectively to do that which we, our grandparents failed to do in the 1930s. Nikki, more women, what I'm really, what I'm, I'm amazed about, I have never been to this part of America before. I've never been in a country that has Canada envy. To, <laughs> right? It's an extraordinary thing. I've never, I've never heard that before. So you are from the Mecca of, tell me, no, but tell me, picking up, picking up on, on, on what Yanis was saying, the idea of getting active 
you're in Parliament every day fighting the fight. What do you make of this? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm here to say that we do need a progressive international movement. We need it for many reasons, but we need it, it as well because my generation, the millennial generation, is facing a crisis. Um, I was first uh, ran when I was 22, was elected at 26. It's now been 10 years. And, uh, and I've had the incredible opportunity uh, to represent a part of the country that's, uh, well, one of the wealthiest parts of the country, but where so many people, and particularly young Indigenous people, live in third world living conditions. Um, I'm also, you know, we live in a country that despite all of the, uh, the, 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 the positives, uh, where, where my generation is facing uh, a kind of inequality, the likes we haven't seen before, and catastrophic climate change. A generation that is very concerned about violence, women uh, facing misogyny, especially progressive women who speak out, racialized communities. We've had mass shootings, whether it was the mosque in Quebec City or more recently in Toronto. Uh, we, we have a generation that is uh, experiencing a kind of angst we're only beginning to talk about. And, uh, and for me, it's, it's, it's no, uh, perhaps it's no surprise why so many people were inspired by the work of, of Bernie and, and the movement that he and you built together uh, because you spoke to the reality that my generation faces. And that's why I think when we're talking about an international progressive moment, we need three things. We need to be on the ground with people on the front lines, including the so many young people that are leading social movements right now. Indigenous, Black Lives Matter, uh, women's uh, 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 feminist activism, LGBTQ activism. Uh, we need to communicate our message. And, uh, you know, and it's been really exciting to meet progressive members of the media here. Because in Canada, let me tell you, it's, uh, it's, it's actually our media concentration is even worse in Canada. And the right wing owns all of it. We need ways of getting our message out. And the third piece is we need, and I would say the most important, is we need bold ideas. Like the kinds of ideas we've been hearing about all weekend here. That is what mobilizes people in my generation. That is what is mobilizing people here and in my country and around the world. And, uh, and, and let's do it. We don't have time to waste. Jeff Sachs, ideas, mobilization, you've spent years and years taking ideas and getting them executed, going through all the hassle, all the hoops, all the pushback. What's the next one? I want to add a concept uh, to our discussion, sustainable development, because it's a good and important concept. It says that we should combine economic prosperity with social justice and with environmental sustainability. This, I think, is the central hard work we have. We have a wealthy world, extraordinarily wealthy world. It's a $130 trillion output this year. It's about $19,000 per person on the planet. But it is socially disastrously unfair, and it is environmentally recklessly unsustainable. Now, the important part that we need to leverage, in my opinion, is that for several unusual reasons, in 2015, the governments of the world actually agreed that this was the challenge for our generation. And they adopted two core principles unanimously at the time. One was the Paris Climate Agreement, and the other is the Sustainable Development Goals. The Sustainable Development Goals call for the end of poverty by 2030, every child in school, universal health coverage, and decarbonizing the energy system. This is our agenda, in my opinion. It's a worldwide agenda. All over the world, people are grappling with these basic challenges, whether it's in the United States or any other part of the world, we actually have, strangely enough, a framework. Of course, we're not applying it. It is not actually being implemented. It's not being implemented because it's impossibly difficult. It's not being implemented because it's unaffordable. It's not being implemented because we lack the technology. 
it's not being implemented because Bernie isn't president right now. <laughs> We have a political problem, but we don't lack for a global agenda, even one that has been agreed and that governments around the world are reporting on. Are coming to the United Nations in September 2019, every head of state will be there. Well, it'll be about 170 heads of state to report on what will be their non-progress on these ambitions. So the agenda is there. Actually, the specifics are there. We're in the political struggle to turn it into reality. And I think the way to do that, of course, is the politics of this room, the Green New Deal, the propositions that we have heard about social justice, what Giannis is uh, doing uh, throughout Europe to win the uh, European elections next year, but to keep our eye on what it is substantively we need to do and how that can be achieved. That's a matter also of the grunt work of taxes and spending and decarbonization and regulation and getting these things in place. But frankly, we don't have time to lose because we're at the end of this story environmentally, as everybody knows. We basically run out of time. We have no more time for new global agreements. Either we implement what we have said we would do or we have lost the planet for at least hundreds of millions of people. Bernie, when you become president, um, <laughs> how will you embrace this? <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> it's well, a very it's a little bit provocative. That day. <laughs> um, look, let me agree with everybody who has already spoken. Uh, the bad news is that we are facing unprecedented challenges. What Yanis will talk about, I'm sure, in a moment, is the rise of right-wing extremism uh, all throughout Europe. Uh, we have talked about the climate disaster. Uh, we have talked about a broken criminal justice system. And by the way, let me thank my wife Jane for this, yeah. is that if if this conference means anything, what it means is that we have to break the silos that currently exist in the progressive movement. Because every issue that we have talked about is related to every other issue. When we talk about, as Jeff just mentioned, literally the top 1% in this globe owning more wealth than the bottom 90%, that's just not wealth, that's power. And when Nikki talks about the media, those are the people who not only own the media in Canada, it's Rupert Murdoch, it's Fox, it's right-wing folks who control the level of discussion in this country and all over the world. It is the fossil fuel industry who worries more about their short-term profits then they worry about the future of this planet. It is the prison industrial complex. It is the military industrial complex. We heard in the last panel the enormous amount of money being spent on prisons and police. We are, forget that, we are spending $700 billion on the military in the United States alone. That is more than the next 10 nations, most of whom are our allies. Throughout the world, we're spending well over a trillion dollars on the military. Think what that could do to alleviate poverty in this world, to provide the quality of education. <laughs> so in fact, to do what all of us know we can do, and that is that we have the technology now to transform our energy system away from fossil fuel. And by the way, when we do that, we create millions of good jobs in this country and around the world. Last point that I want to make, and I'm sure Yanis, who comes in a sense from where the real battles, many of the battles are taking place now, and that is the growth of authoritarianism. What all of us have got to do, I mean, we've all talked about the need to get out of our classrooms and, 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 and to get into the battle, to go into the areas where where the people are.
But please understand this, in my view, maybe I speak only for myself, Trump became president of the United States because there is a massive amount of pain in this country, which is not seen on television, which many of my Democratic colleagues do not know and do not talk about. The life expectancy in the United States of America has declined for the third straight year. And often that is taking place in rural areas where people have no income, no jobs, no education, no hope for their kids. So we have got to reach out to all of our brothers and sisters, black and white and Latino and Native American and Asian American, and come up with that agenda that speaks for all of us, not just the 1%. Okay, I'm going to hold those, those ideas. Thank you very much, Frank. Because I want to go to Europe. Ada, I want to go to yourself. You're mayor of Barcelona. You're going to talk to us a little bit. Tina, are you going to give us a hand? Oh, absolutely. Anytime. Okay. So, Ada, tell me your story in Barcelona. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'm so sorry because my English is so bad. So I try to speak in English, but uh, we have Tina, a friend, that helped us. And first of all, thank you so much uh, for the invi this invitation. For us, it's very important. I'm, I'm very grateful to be here. If you had told me uh, four years ago that I, a uh, working class woman that didn't have contact with the elites or with any kind of power, would be elected mayor of Barcelona, would be here with Bernie Sanders all, and all of you, I wouldn't believe it. I think, I think you say here, uh, yes, we can, and in Spain we say, si se puede. <laughs> So for us, it's very important uh, to be here with you today, and uh, let me explain why in a few words. I'm here representing Barcelona and Comú, which is a citizen platform of common people. In my case, I'm from a working class family. I've worked in a lot of precarious uh, jobs. I was an activist for human rights and anti-evictions movement. But the most important thing is uh, that it's not just my case. Most members of Barcelona and Comú are the same, common people. Some come from social movements, some from academia, or for, from new political parties. And we decided to set up a new project for Barcelona, not just a new party, but a new way of doing politics. More inclusive, more democratic, more feminist, more innovative. And we decide to start at local level because the politics of austerity and corruption had destroyed the credibility of public institutions. We needed to provide real and concrete solutions through actions that change people's lives. Because the local level is the best place to improve democracy. It's where we live our daily lives and is where the government is closed to the people. So we came together around our shared goals for the city and with, uh, without having any media or economical or political power, we won the elections three years ago. I was elected a first woman mayor in the history of Barcelona. But you know, you know that winning elections was just the first step. <laughs> Only the first step. <laughs> What's happened in the last three years? Let me start by saying it has not been easy. Uh, we are in a minority in government. We've had a complicated situation in Catalonia, as you probably know. And cities, in general, has limited powers. But despite this, we've changed the agenda. Today, Barcelona is the city with the highest social investment in Spain. For example, we've, we've created a special investment plan for the poorest neighborhoods, or in healthcare, which is not a municipal responsibility. We have created a municipal dentist and a mental health plan. But it's not just uh, about increasing social investment. It's not enough. 
We are here because we are making, we need to make structural changes. Like for example, creating the, the first municipal energy company in Spain that provides green energy to city facilities. On, uh, and for the first time, the city government is standing up to multinationals who speculate in our city. We are forcing big companies to pay their taxes for the first time. <laughs> and inspiring, inspired by other cities like New York, and here we have Bill de Blasio, a friend. Inspired by other cities, we are forcing constructors to make 30% of all new housing affordable. And we have, and we have uh, Finet, Airbnb, for advertising uh, illegal apartments and creating gentrification. So why, why it's important for us to be here today? Not only to share experiences. Um, we need initiatives like this because we don't have uh, media, economical power. People stop us in the street every week and say that the news of what we are doing doesn't reach them. And our adversaries are organizing to stop us, of course. <laughs> they are circulating fake news. For example, every week, and it's true, Every week, people stop me and ask me why I have moved to the richest neighborhood in the city, which is a lie, of course. <laughs> and the opposition parties are des des desperately looking for famous candidates for the elections in May, next May. For example, one of these parties is bringing a former prime minister of France to stand against me. Um, that's why this initiative is so important, uh, right? Right now, the racist, violent, homophobic, and sexist far right is organizing. We need to amplify all of the alternatives we are building around the world to prove that we are not alone and that change is possible. In the face of the far right that feeds on the fear of our neighbors, we need to build hope and build this hope together with others not against the other. Only in this way, with alliances built from below, can we defeat the Salvinis, Bolsonaros, and Trumps in the world. Because we want a feminist world, which means equality for all and putting life at the center. We need to build community, locally and internationally. A community that can transform fear into hope. It won't be easy. But I'm convinced it's possible. It's up to us to make it happen. And I think with you, it's possible. Thank you very much. Wonderful. 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 Now, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, it's very uncharacteristic for an Irish person to be on time for anything, okay? Right? But I, we were supposed to start a wee bit earlier, and we have a flight back to Ireland. We have to go. It's funny, I was thinking uh, when, when the, when the sh gigs were running over and over, because I'm going to leave you in uh, the capable hands of Yanis, when the, when the chat was getting more chatty and more chatty and going longer and longer. Uh, what Oscar Wilde said to George Bernard Shaw when Shaw asked Wilde in London, why aren't you becoming a socialist? And uh, Wilde just looks at him and says, because their meetings go on too long. <laughs> he says, I don't have time to be a socialist. Ladies and gentlemen, in the capable hands of Yanis, I leave you. Thank you very much indeed. Well, this is, this is an unexpected honor. <laughs> And allow me to abuse immediately my new authority, uh, because there, there is a score I need to settle. Now, the reason why you know me, I'll speak personally just for a second. The reason why you know me is because my country uh, went down the toilet in 2010, to put it um, uh, vulgarly. Uh, what happened was, of course, the subprime pain from the Midwest through the circuits of financial capital, traveled to Europe, turned Avacolao into a campaigner against foreclosures. This is why she became known. This is how she grew up as a 
leader of a movement, as a woman that was fighting against evictions, home evictions in the suburbs of Barcelona. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, my country became the most dystopic laboratory of austerity. We are the champions, the Olympic champions of austerity in Greece. Mm -hmm. The result is that as we speak today, 60%, I'll repeat that number, 60% of children in Greece are below the poverty line, the 2008 poverty line. One in two families have no one working in it. Now, what happened then? Such a great depression, friends, begets a progressive movement that responds and Nazis. We have the third largest party in our parliament is a not, not a neo-Nazi party. There's nothing neo about them. They do zig highs, they have Hitler. Huh? At the same time, our progressive movement won the election in 2015. And this is why you know. And here is how I'm going to settle my score here at this very moment. Immediately, a certain senator from Vermont <laughs> wrote a brilliant letter. You remember that letter? to the managing director of, of the International Monetary Fund, Christine Lagarde, and shared a piece of his mind with her regarding the uh, crime against logic, not just humanity, that the IMF and other institutions, credited institutions, were. Effectively, we are the Puerto Rico of Europe. And it's not my saying, this was what the finance minister of Germany said uh, to your own finance minister, Jack Lew, when Jack Lew just very mildly complained about the treatment of Greece by Germany, the German government, but not by Germany. And uh, Wolfgang Schäuble said, would you trade Puerto Rico for Greece? This is the kind of mindset which typifies the collapse. Now, during that month as well, um, a certain professor of economics from this country, actually a couple of them, and both of them are in the room, one is Jeff Sachs, the other is Jamie Galbraith, joined my team and we did battle together. The reason why I'm saying that is because interconnectedness, as Bernie was saying, is at the heart both of the Nazi movement the, and the establishment, the two faces of authoritarianism. Because Mr. Valls, who's going to be competing against ABBA, is one of the faces of authoritarianism. Macron, Merkel are the same face. The ones who said to me when I moved into the corridors of power very, very fleetingly, they said to me, elections cannot be allowed to change economic policy, to which I responded, this is a great piece of news for the Chinese Communist Party because they believe the same. <laughs> and the other face of the same monster of authoritarianism, of course, is the Nazis that are growing up everywhere, the Trumps. Mr. Bannon understands internationalism. He is going up and down Europe trying to organize the Salvinis, the Kurtzis, the Zerhofers against civilization, effectively. We have to respond with a progressive international. In the previous sections, we were talking about the Green New Deal. If we do not succeed in the international Green New Deal, not an American one, not a North American one, not a white one, not a European Atlanticist Green New Deal, but an international New Deal, ruin without end is going to loom black across our lands, our rivers, our mountains. It is a major responsibility. And that's why I want now to turn to Nikki and say, <laughs> how do we build the institutions that will carry out, not just talk about the Green New Deal? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, uh, on a personal note, I appreciate the story you shared. Uh, uh, Yanni, as, uh, as a proud, uh, also Greek Canadian, you know, I, I, uh, uh, Greece has gone such a, through such a difficult time, and unfortunately, the right wing and even countries like mine in Canada used uh, uh, used Greece as a uh, um, you know as a, as a political pawn to get its uh, its message out as well. I mean, we, we have our work cut out for us, uh, but I do think that uh, what's really important to recognize is that there is an appetite for change. And, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I join many in hoping that uh, the individual sitting next to me will run again for president, because, uh, because it's clear to me that, 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 that you, Bernie, I... Um, <laughs> 
you had your finger on the pulse of not just where people in your country are at, but also where people increasingly in my country and around the world are at as well. And what I really appreciate about the work that you've done and so many people here this weekend is that you believe that change can be achieved through the political process. And speaking of, of these institutions, we have to connect the theory with action and we have to get involved at the ballot box. Uh, you know, and, and, and talking about it is not enough. Talking about it in, uh, uh, you know, from afar is not enough. We need to get on, on the ground. We need to organize. I will also say that, uh, you know, and I, I can't reinforce this enough, it is about ideas. You know, I'm, I'm proud to be part of a progressive movement in my own country in Canada, but all too often progressives have gotten elected and turned to using right-wing agendas. In fact, and they implement them in ways that you wouldn't even see the right implement with different words, different uh, images, right, uh, public relations, but in the end it's the same sort of, uh, the, the same, uh, uh, the same sort of policies. And so we need uh, to be very uh, courageous, we need to believe in our, in our convictions, and we need to speak truth to power uh, in, uh, in envisioning that different world. And if I can just spend a moment in terms of what's, what's happening in Canada, because David had mentioned it is, it is sort of, there's a lot of envy here, although I will say Vermont is stunning and, and people here are very cool, so, uh, um, you know, I'd love to live here. Uh, but, uh, uh, but all to say, it's, 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 not, uh, it's not what you think it is. I mean, right now we have a prime minister who has invested $4.5 billion, our dollars, into buying a pipeline. Right? I mean, this is, a, this is a prime minister and a government that are right hand in hand with big oil. It's a prime minister who's attacking indigenous peoples day in and day out and disrespecting their rights. It's a prime minister who's just brought uh, 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 back to work legislation for postal workers in our country, an anti-worker agenda. And so, you know, don't, don't believe what you hear. I'm not saying it to this room because you know. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, but we have our work cut out for us in Canada. And, uh, and we need to keep pushing the envelope. You know, in Canada, we talk a lot about the health care that we have. We don't actually have Medicare for all. We don't have pharmacare. Uh, we don't have uh, uh, dental care. These are the kinds of things that, uh, that, that we need to keep pushing for. And, and what you've done here inspires us to do that. Free tuition. We also don't have that. I remember telling somebody that I work closely with, I said, look, Bernie Sanders is talking about this. We need to get with the program here in our own country and, uh, and, and push for free tuition. And ultimately, I mean, you know, it's, uh, we, we, need, uh, you know we, we need to call out those that are not, uh, you know, they're not on our side, and we need to work uh, with those that are already doing the work, pushing for change. They are out there day in, day out and particularly young people, people in my generation and those that are coming up that are doing it from a place of uh, some desperation, some, yes, inspiration, but some with an extreme sense of urgency. Thank you. Jeff. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to stick to the, to the rotation that David uh, introduced. <laughs> because we Irish and Greeks are the blacks of Europe, as we used to say in England, when we used to study there. Now, uh, uh, Jeff, sustainable development, which is something that uh, you breathe uh, and live on a daily basis as an academic, as an activist, as a person of influence uh, across many different continents. How do we build the institutions from scratch and which institutions from the Washington Consensus do we usurp in order to build the Green New Deal that will provide sustainable development? And how do we do this in practice and in political terms? Good. Clear goals, clear plans, and accountability. I would say those are the three things. On goals, we know, for example, that we must decarbonize the world's energy system by 2050. This is the core, grim message of the science repeated last week by the U.S. government, three weeks ago by the IPCC, by our experience uh, every day. How do you do that? Well, there are a lot of uh, important technical considerations of how to move from coal, oil, and gas to wind, solar, hydro, and uh, other uh, power. It happens, by the way, that the single best uh, vision of this is actually China's, uh, which is uh, so unknown in this country. 
but extremely important because Chinese engineers have done tremendous work on how to connect the world's renewable energy in long distance transmission, which is, happens to be an extraordinarily important uh, idea. Now, instead of having a maniacal trade war with China right now, which is some fantasy of American primacy on everything, because all this is is just the next attempt for to preserve what the uh, American uh, military establishment uh, believes to be our uh, inherent divine right to rule the world. Uh, we ought to be talking with the Chinese about how to build this global grid. So that's a plan. And then is accountability. You know, one thing on any sensible plan, I read hundreds of them uh, year by year, there's no place for the Trans Mountain Pipeline, for example, in any sensible plan in the world. Justin Trudeau should be ashamed of what he's doing. <laughs> And, and the truth is that it's not hard to have accountable standards for what we need to do, but we don't have them. Let me give another example of accountability. Giannis's government, Greece, was uh, partly screwed up, and I take special resentment for an obvious reason, by Goldman Sachs. They use my name. Uh, it is no, no relationship, but they committed... Uh, financial fraud massively in your country and helped uh, to make a, a deep crisis. In this country, uh, they, of course, were lead agents of the toxic assets that created the 2008 financial crisis. They knowingly sold them. Uh, then afterwards, Lloyd Blankfein, the then CEO, said, well, they're big boys on the other side. If, if we cheat, they should figure that out. And then uh, the most recent news, uh, of course, a couple of weeks ago, is that they're deeply implicated in the multi-billion dollar fraud and scandal in Malaysia. How does this company keep its license for another day, honestly? This is a shocking business of unaccountable... It runs the treasury. Pardon me? It runs the treasury. Mm -hmm. it, uh, of course, it has run the government. It, uh, each time you call, get the next secretary of treasury from... Exactly. Goldman, but this is the complete impunity in which we operate as well. What Bernie proved is that this nation is completely on to this. The politics make sense, but we have to call out our nice friends with good smiles that are building the wrong pipelines, even nationalizing them to guarantee this uh, absurd policy. We need standards, and so my view is, my view is that uh, we, it, it is not only to mobilize, but to mobilize right now because we're running out of time along clear lines of what to do. And that, I think, uh, we can know, and like has been said repeatedly, the problems cannot be solved in any country alone. Uh, it's just not even, the, the types of problems we're finding are not national problems anymore. They are global scale, whether they're global financial, global tax, global uh, carbon dioxide, uh, global uh, 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 behavior, uh, corporate uh, accountability. These are inherently global problems that require global cooperation. In the meantime, we're making wars across the world and with our 800 some military bases across the world and uh, trying to preserve uh, some illusory and extraordinarily destructive uh, vision of an American empire and we ain't solving the problems. Bernie, how do we deal with the oil curse, the energy curse, the resources curse and the finance curse, Wall the Wall Street curse? Look, I think what we understand, as I said a moment ago, everything is related. So before I answer your question, Yannis, let me urge everybody to think in every possible way how they can get progressive ideas out to people. You know, we talk about Trump winning states by 30 points. Understand that in those states, 
Nobody is hearing progressive voices. All they're watching is Fox television or listening to right-wing radio. And we can have all of the brilliant ideas we want here. And one of the reasons that Jane has all these cameras here, by the way, not, you know, just a thousand people. It's a small group of people. The goal here is to use social media, to get these ideas out all across the country. But to do that, we need all of your help. Yes. And I'll give you an example of what we are trying to do in my Senate office. Because the media does not talk about income and wealth inequality, because they do not talk about Medicare for all, because essentially they do not talk about climate change, we have held live stream town meetings, which in some instances, at least one, have gotten us more viewers at that moment than CNN had. Yeah. All right? So there is revolutionary potential in social media. Okay, without boasting, my guys told me that we had more social media engagement on Facebook this week than Donald Trump did. So please, before we even get into the specifics, of whether it is racism or climate change or whatever it may be, it's not good enough to talk to each other. Get that word out to people who have not heard these ideas. All right. To answer Yanis's uh, question, um, I believe uh, that the progressive movement uh, is going to have to do something which for some people, some of our friends, is uncomfortable. Everybody here is righteous about talking about racism and sexism and homophobia and religious bigotry, and God only knows that we need to stand up and fight on all of those issues. But you know what else we have to stand up and fight on? Which too few of us are now doing. And that is the greed and recklessness of Wall Street. Yes. All right? You're not going to see too much of that on CBS. But you got a half a dozen, Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, a half a dozen major financial institutions that have assets of what, 60% of the GDP of America. These people have incredible power. They run Greece. They run countries all over the world. We have to deal with the fact that three people in America own more wealth than the bottom half of our country. And as Jeff kind of implied it, all, they're nice people. Many of them are pro-choice. Many of them have gay friends or gay staff members. It's true. Yet they run the world and their greed is destroying this world. And we have got to be vigorous in standing up to them. I think the issue, what we have going for us, and where I feel very positive about, is that when you explain issues to people, when you ask people, are you happy with giving tax breaks for billionaires? You know what people say? No, they should pay more in taxes. Do you believe in Medicare for all? Yes. Do you believe we should deal with climate change? Yes. Do you need criminal justice reform? Yes, immigration reform. You got a president demonizing immigrants, overwhelming majority of the people in this country believe in comprehensive immigration reform. People do not believe in tax breaks for billionaires and cutting Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, which is exactly what the Republican leadership believes. So the question that we have got to ask ourselves, how does it happen that when people agree with us on virtually all of the issues, strongly disagree with Republicans on the issues, how do they do so well politically? And some of that has to do with an issue we've got to deal with. And I want to hear our European friends talk about it. My feeling is that when people are pushed aside economically in rural areas, when people uh, are hurting, you have demagogues who deal with that pain and say the problem is, is that Mexican immigrant who's picking strawberries for $8 an hour, or that person from Syria who has come in to the UK, all right? So you take that anger 
and frustration and hurt that people are feeling, and you turn them against people who are in worse shape than you are. All right. And our job is to bring our people together to say, no, it is not some Mexican picking strawberries for eight bucks an hour who is our enemy. It is Wall Street. It is the fossil fuel industry. It is the drug companies. It's the insurance companies. Let's stand together and take those people. Ada Colau is with us, and because of our long-standing relationship, I happen to know that Ada, as the mayor of Barcelona, did something magnificent. At the time of uh, demonization of migrants, at the time when our governments were instructed not to accept any and to effectively to use the Mediterranean Sea as uh, a great tomb by which to deter further immig emigration into Europe, Avocalao gave an order to create uh, homes, uh, to convert existing buildings and dwellings for thousands of refugees. And guess what happened? <laughs> the Spanish government and Brussels prevented her from taking in refugees from Lesbos, from Sicily, from the other parts of um, Europe, southern Europe, that are being used to this day as concentration camps for lost souls. So, Ava, what are we going to do about this? <laughs> um, um, maybe it's better if I speak in Spanish and we use okay, Tina because it's a very important issue. And um, seguramente la crisis um, de la, la crisis de Europa en la acogida de los migrantes, porque no hay una crisis de los inmigrantes, hay una crisis de la democracia europea, ¿no? Exactly. The, the, it's not a crisis. We are not talking about a, a crisis of the immigrants, but a crisis of the democracy in regard to this. Um, eh, Europa is de las zonas del mundo que menos inmigración acoge. So Europe is one of the areas in the world that um, a, a, a smaller number of uh, immigrants are, are um, uh, taken. Pero cierra sus fronteras. They close their, their borders. Y condena a morir miles de personas cada año en el mar Mediterráneo. And, and condemn many mil, um, thousands of, of souls, as you said before, in the Mediterranean Sea to die. Entonces, las ciudades, ¿qué podemos hacer? No? Frente a una política racista, porque aquí hablamos de una política que institucionalmente es racista. So what, uh, what can we do an, uh, in front of, um, of a, a, a policy that is racist, fundamentally racist? Entonces, como ciudades no tenemos competencias en inmigración. We don't have, as cities, we don't have competencias um, with immigration. Pero no, no nos rendimos porque estamos aquí porque sí se puede. But of course we can do it, so we are not going to say no to this. Entonces, eh, el, una de las cosas que hemos hecho es una alianza de ciudades, refugee cities. So one of the, one of the solutions that we made, one of the initiatives was to have an alliance of cities, refugee cities. Para presionar a las instituciones europeas, denunciar que se está violando el derecho internacional, es decir, en nombre de la democracia se está violando la legalidad. Uh, to pressure the cities to, to denounce the fact that in, in name um, of this situation, um, excuse me, could you repeat that? No, que, que nos juntamos porque, para denunciar que Europa está siendo ilegal. Es, no Europe, son los inmigrantes ilegales, es Europa ilegal porque incumple la ley internacional. Because Europe is the one that is illegal because it's, it's not following the, the, the legality that should be. The, the immigrants are not the ones illegal. Entonces, eh, las ciudades buscamos acciones, por ejemplo, en Barcelona... Eh, no tenemos un, eh, una flota oficial, no tenemos barcos eh, de, de, porque somos un ayuntamiento, pero nosotros colaboramos con barcos que están salvando vidas humanas en medio del mar, colaboramos con esos barcos para salvar vidas. So we need to, to invent possibilities. Uh, one of the things that, uh, for example, um, in, in this case, certain cities that cannot have other solutions. So this particular solution is to, since uh, Barcelona doesn't have their own um, uh, float, 
uh, of ships, uh, they, they co collaborate with other places that have that option, that have those ships. Con NGOs que tienen barcos y hay, hay, nosotros ayudamos a esas NGOs que salvan vidas en, la, en el mar. So, so ONGs, ONGs that have those um, ships, those, those possibilities, then they collaborate with those ONGs. O colaboramos con ciudades, por ejemplo, I don't know if you know Riace, is a little town of uh, south of Italy, and they have an experience very important because I think no, it's the best important thing. It's it's important to have reason, but I think a classical error of of a classical most of classical left parties is to think that uh, have reason. Is enough. It's not enough. No? You, you need action. You need to demonstrate with concrete examples that there's an alternative. No? And in, in south in Italy, uh, Riace, uh, there's a mayor um, that opened um, his little town to immigrants. Y es un pequeño pueblo que estaba perdiendo población y que estaba en una inactividad y gracias a la política de acogida de inmigrantes el pueblo ahora ha mejorado su situación. So this particular town, as a small town that didn't have any, um, demographically speaking, it was like losing. Um, there was, it was an, no, no, they, they did have with this opportunity new people coming to this town that otherwise didn't have people. Entonces, es una demostración concreta. En la Italia, donde gobierna el fascista Salvini, hay un alcalde que demuestra que la inmigración es positiva y genera riqueza. So, this is an excellent uh, example in this particular case of this small town in Italy that you can create that, those possibilities with progressive laws. No, pero que es positiva la inmigración porque genera riqueza para el propio pueblo. Uh, the immigration is positive because it actually generates wealth to the, to the town itself. Entonces, por eso Salvini eh, ha denunciado en la justicia al alcalde de Riace, Mimo Lucano, y el alcalde de Riace ahora mismo ha sido procesado por fomentar la inmigración ilegal y ha sido obligado a dejar su pueblo, que es, no tiene precedentes esto. So, uh, finally, what happened was that actually the, the, the... The, <laughs> Mimo Lucano, el alcalde de Riace. The, 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 uh, the mayor of Riace was actually... Um, arrested. Arrested. Mm -hmm y obligado a alejarse de su ciudad. So he act, the, the paradox is that he had to leave he, uh, his own city. Um, por Salvini, el fascista Salvini. For, yeah. And, pero ¿por qué? Salvini is afraid from Mimo Lucano, a little mayor of a little town, because he demonstrated that uh, 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 political of, uh, of refugees, welcome refugees, is positive for Italy and for Italian people. And, and now I think it's very important that all of us, we have to say that Mimo Lucano is the mayor of the world. It's our mayor and we have to defend Mimo Lucano. Well, at this stage, um, it is incumbent upon me to call to the stage Jane Sanders, Dave Riskell, and Renata Villa, representing the Sanders Institute and TM25, because what we're now going to reveal to you is that this gathering was not meant to end this weekend. We are, well, I want, yes, I need to look at everyone at the same time. We are now going to issue an open call to all progressives in the world, because what happens as of tomorrow is going to make any difference uh, in this fight against the two faces of authoritarianism, against the Salvinis of the world on the one hand, and the so-called liberal establishment that created the crisis that begat the Salvinis of the world. So, here it is, and I'm reading it. You want me to read it, yeah, right? I want you to read okay. it. We wrote it together. <laughs> there is a global war being waged against workers, against our environment, against democracy, against decency. A network of right-wing factions is collaborating across borders to erode human rights, to silence dissent, to promote intolerance. Not since the 1930s has humanity faced such an existentialist threat. To defeat them, we cannot simply go back to the failed status quo of the last few decades. 
Unfettered globalization promised peace and prosperity, but it delivered financial crisis, needless war, and disastrous climate change instead. The time has come for progressives to form a grassroots movement for global justice, to mobilize workers, women, the disenfranchised, all around the world, behind the shared vision of democracy, prosperity, sustainability, and solidarity, especially for the young generation. Yes. <laughs> there are Those are my terms. Our Progressive International will reach out to communities in every corner of the world to help build our shared vision. Our Progressive International will stand by people who are already fighting to end inequality, exploitation, discrimination, and environmental degradation. Our Progressive International will reclaim our communities, our cities, our countries, and our planet with a bold international New Deal, Green New Deal, that we will work together to deliver. It is time for progressives of the world to unite. Today, on behalf of DiEM25 and the Sanders Institute, we issue a call to action to create a global network of individuals and organizations that will fight together for dignity, peace, prosperity, and the future of our planet. Join us. Join the Progressive International by visiting this page. Well, we can't see it. Bring it down, someone. Uh, it's progressiveinternational.something. There it is. Dot org. Progressiveinternational.org. You can become members. You can register uh, as organizations, political movements, political parties, because we have to get down to work in real time, not simply meet once every six months, every 12 months. Jane, do you want to say something? Just that we've heard from this international panel, and we've heard from panels throughout the entire weekend, or the couple of days that we've been here, and we'll hear again tomorrow, uh, that we need to be paying attention to, uh, to working together, not siloed, not siloed by country, by border, by race, by gender, by issue. We need to work together and define a, a, an international progressive New Deal, New Green Deal. And the first endorsement is coming on our screen right now from the Prime Minister of Iceland, mm. the wonderful leader of the left Green spread of reactionary politics and the rise of the radical rights in the world today. I served as a member of a progressive government after the backing collapse in Iceland 28. We managed actually to counterbalance austerity with redistribution designed to protect our social welfare system. This shows that it is possible to resist anti-social ideologies designed by neoliberal ideologies. Therefore, I want to give my voice to Progressive International, which is strongly committed to transformative politics, sustainability, economic and social rights, and the dignity for all people. And now, and because as Bernie Sanders said, we have to become good at being propagandists. We cannot allow the right and the authoritarians to get away with their continuing triumphs at the level of uh, communication. So here's our first video as a progressive international. There is a global struggle taking place of enormous consequence. Nothing less than the future of humanity is at stake. All around us, we see the status quo is failing. The top 1% now controls half the world's wealth, while hundreds of millions of workers remain trapped between poverty and precarity. Where globalization promised prosperity, it's delivered financial crisis and endless war instead. All the while, our climate moves closer to destruction. Out of this crisis, global authoritarianism is rising. These leaders promise to restore national pride by attacking minorities, a free press, and democracy itself. But in the end, 
they only serve themselves. A chilling echo of the 1930s. Today's authoritarian leaders do not stand alone. They are part of a global axis of right-wing parties that shares funders, strategy and contacts. And around the world, they are gaining power. The time has come to form our own common front in the fight for global peace and prosperity. This movement will bring people together across the global left to think about the world we want to live in and how we make it a reality. A grassroots movement mobilizing working people all around the world behind a shared vision of democracy, sustainability and solidarity. We will no longer settle for reformism. We will reach out to communities in every corner of the world and build shared power and solidarity. In every country, there are people who are fighting for progress. And we are so much stronger together. It is time for progressives of the world to unite. Let us begin today building a better tomorrow. international.org join we need you we have to start because we inherited this mess we need to build the future together and as a Greek who has every right to barge in and give advice to Bernie Sanders let me convey a message from all of us in Europe for all those comrades of yours that are now struggling to reclaim our Europe our cities our world our environment we need Bernie Sanders to run for president. <laughs> and that's also why we're here. On that note, 